Thanks very much, Joe, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Joe mentioned, uh, my name is Matt. I'm the uh, Director of Business Analytics uh, at Swinburne University of Technology. Um, I'm glad I didn't put up an infographic because I think we're slightly dwarfed by the University of Queensland. So, uh, But we're a dual sector organisation. Uh, we cover both high, higher education and vocational education streams. Uh, and our main campus is based in Hawthorne in Melbourne. Um, I think David touched on some, some key points. You know, most educational uh, institutions um, are really doubling down on the efforts to improve student experience uh, and student outcomes, um, as well as really uh, try and drive um, meaningful research with uh, social and economic impact. And I guess our university's um, no exception to that. Um, but we need to do that sustainably, and we need to do that efficiently. Um, if you think about the backdrop that education is in, you know, as a sector, it's, it's really being challenged by you know, the way, the why, the how, and the who consume education. Um, and it's also constrained in some regards by the effective capping of student placements and government funding. Um, so universities have to be clever about how they consume uh, resources. Um, it's in that context that, um, that the, the use of um, provision of timely information and insights, but also the use of analytics to improve decision making becomes incredibly important. Uh, and I just wanted to use today to try and share some um, examples of how we're starting to realise the value of a data and analytics program at the university um, as a result of work that we've sort of been um, pushing out for, for nearly three years now. Um, just to give some context on, on the team, so the business analytics team is, is a reasonably unique team. It's centrally located to support the whole university across reporting and analytics, um, but it is centrally located. So we're a team in our own right. We're not part of a finance team or an IT team, which is sometimes unusual. As you would expect, the team has deep technical expertise, um, very efficient with, um, with a range of technologies and languages, but obviously a very strong focus on AWS and also all the team are Tableau certified. In terms of what we tackle and what we cover, um, and no, those aren't new recruits in that photo there. I mean, we do have students, but they're quite, they're not students. Um, in terms of what the team covers, there's probably four key areas. Um, the one that we've spent the most time on uh, is this aggregated, um, consolidated information, which we call the Swinburne Information Hub, which is our enterprise um, data platform, which is what we use to service aggregated and de-identified information for executive reporting, management reporting, um, but also make available for exploratory analysis and ad hoc reporting. Uh, the team's also involved um, very much so in student reporting, operational reporting for our student platform, and we have deep subject matter expertise in that domain. Uh, we're very heavily involved in government submissions and are responsible for a lot of the compliance submissions to state and federal government across higher ed and vocational education and the dissemination of that information back out to the university from government. And then more recently, we're starting to progress some of the core analytics challenges that face the university to address those big strategic um, intents. Uh, and I'll touch on some of those. And there's probably a fifth one here, which is really what we're doing around some of the digital innovation, and I'll touch on some of those aspects right at the end. Um, in terms of what was our starting point, um, I think about three years ago in 2016, I joined three years ago the university. I think it, just as I joined, or just before I joined, there was a bit of a realisation that potentially the university had not invested sufficiently in building out robust structures and processes for reporting, um, and there was a lot of confusion and conflict around the reporting. Um, nor did it have necessarily a clear analytics roadmap and a, and a capability to build that um, capacity in the organisation. Um, we face a, a couple of um, challenges, whoa, which, which maybe um, resonate with others. The idea across the organisation, the biggest one, we had multiple views being created by multiple users and being taken to meetings where, where different perspectives were being given to the same, to the same question, which caused um, a lot of um, discontent. Uh, we had no single point of reference uh, for the university, uh, and if you take those two points into account, you could see it was easy for a lack of trust to start to form about the reliability of our reporting. For our team, um, if you take the above, no data repository, we would just replicate using leveraging um, replicated data files to provision our reporting. Um, and what was happening is we were just doing one-off requests, we were landing them on our reporting server, they were not being used again. So we end up with what we call somewhere between a dumping ground and a graveyard on our reporting server. Um, and our team was just unable to keep up as the, as the cadence of the university requirements um, increased. And uh, if you're really going to provision insightful information, you really do need some tools to store that data effectively and to manage it. And um, uh, what we did was actually the first cloud-based proof of concept at the university using a thin slice of student one data, or operational data, um, to prove out a use case using AWS uh, cloud technology. Um, 
The data sovereignty issue was addressed, obviously, with the opening of the Sydney node and the, the keeping the, um, our data within, within Australia. But we had to do, still do a lot of work with the organisation, particularly IT, to get them across the line in terms of the cost, the security, um, and the speed of the technology. Um, and once they saw what had been developed and were involved in some of the co-creation, um, you know, they, they've ad advocated this and it's actually being used to build out a more broad enterprise data platform as we speak. Um, the other thing we really like about AWS, obviously, is, and it probably wasn't as apparent to us then as it is now, is the, the proliferation of services which allow us to, to do some fairly unique things um, now that we have all this information to hand. And so some of the things that we were spending many, many months on building, the, the idea that that's now available as a service um, that we can produce readily is, is obviously of big appeal. Um, in terms of the other thing, um, noting our team, what's, what's interesting, I think, for us is uh, while IT set up the network and provisioned the information or passes information from source systems, um, normally through some ESB process through MuleSoft, our team is actually responsible once it's in S3 for unencrypting it and passing it through to Redshift for doing the transformations and um, modeling, for building out the, the governed data sets, for understanding user requirements, building the Tableau dashboards, training those, taking feedback, um, what this enables us to be is very responsive to additional requirements from the business because we can source extra data or we can add it in and make it available. We can build up new reports or new views or add dimensionality. And so it allows us to be very responsive to, to customers' needs, um, which we find to be very effective. Um, there were probably three or four things that we did, we think we've done reasonably well that have, that have um, contributed to, I guess, the engagement with what we've built out across the university. Um, the first was the whole idea of data governance, and I think you know, David touched on the fact that they're doing it last. Um, we had a slightly different approach. We, we wanted to tackle data governance, but we didn't want to try and eat the elephant in terms of taking on enterprise data governance. I think people were asking, are you doing that? And our view was actually no. We started with something very small and focused, which was we're going to take on data standards and data quality that pertain to the data that's, that we're going to provision through the reporting for our end users to start with. So we're only going to focus on the data in the platform and we're only going to focus around measures and standards that pertain to reporting that we're going to deliver because we needed to get traction and we needed to bring effectively some law and order to, to the environment in which we're operating. We actually used a very simple form and publish approach. So we would sit with the business, um, the business would own, uh, the, we would ask them to own the process, we would have system owners and business owners, we would talk about, let's pick a few standard definitions and let's debate them, and it's, it's quite eye-opening when you get six or seven people debating a, a foundational measure with different perspectives in the same room. You start to see how it's very easy to get confusion across your reporting. Um, and, but we would do workshops with those. We would have a system and business owner. They would need to define the standard or the measure. They would need to sign off on that, and they would need to socialise it with key users. As that went through iterations, we would then store that down from a Word doc to a PDF, load it on the wiki, and it became the standard by which we were then consuming our reporting. And it was very simple, it was very manageable, it was very cost effective. It allowed us, our own team, to work with the business to get it done. It didn't require a big investment and it wasn't something that was overly complex for the business to understand and own. And so we had a lot of traction with that. Um, we did a lot of change. Uh, the reporting that was currently there, as I talked about, was probably seen as a bit of a graveyard. There was no trust in, in what was built. We had to do a massive relaunch. And, and I've never been a, a really understood change or the importance of it until I saw it done well. Um, and I think it was done really well at the university. And, and um, it's quite a confronting exercise to, to put yourself out there and relaunch and communicate. Uh, we're a bunch of data people who would prefer a screen to a computer, a human interaction. And so to put yourself out there and engage and get people excited about what you're building um, takes a lot of, a lot of energy for, um, for people in the team, but is well worth it. We did a whole host of techniques. We did videos. We produced video content to share with the university. We did lunch, lunches, lunch and learns. We ran labs. We ran drop-in centers. We would have cost anyone that walked within 30 meters of the team to talk to them about what we were doing and take them through journey walls. And we did that for about 18 months. And we really just sort of, through guerrilla marketing, really entrenched what we were building. Um, and lastly, we created a brand. So we actually called ourselves uh, the reporting Dapper. So no one knows as a Tableau you know, capability on top of AWS. They just refer to it as Dapper. Uh, we came up with some data analytics, performance planning, executive reporting. It was really just to get Dapper to fit. So we could put a bow tie, we dress up in suits and bow ties, and we would do activities. Um, but it's been incredibly effective. So no one cares what the technology is. And actually, it's very approachable for people who used to think our Tableau reports were rubbish because they're still Tableau reports, they're just done better, they're branded, they're, they've got a stamp of approval. The bow tie tells you it's a source of truth, it's been governed, it's been 
Um, we've managed it and curated it. Uh, and our team is now actually called the Dapper team. So no one calls us business analytics. No one ever knows what our team is. We're just called Dapper. Whatever we do, we're called Dapper. Except when you wear a hoodie. Um, um, I think the other thing we did well was, was training. Training, 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 training. DAP is used right across the university. There's a bit of a heat map of the departmental usage and intensity, and, and most departments in the university use our reports. Um, but really, uh, the left-hand side is the key thing. We've trained well over 800, nearly 900 people in face-to-face -face sessions where they sit an hour and a half and they actually go through sessions to understand the privilege of accessing university information, the importance of data governance and data quality, um, their obligations around using that information and what can and can't be shared and how it needs to be disseminated. Once they do that training, they get their DAPA license. We call them, ironically, we call them DAPsters, and they're free to start to access content on the platform. Once they show capability and the, the need that they might need more, more enhanced access, they do some further training, more around capability in the tool, and maybe reminding them of their, their obligations. They get, become dynamic DAPsters. They can start to download data. They can start to potentially bring their own data to the platform. We're going to move them. Designers is a new thing that we're training at the moment. We would actually have them bring their own data and maybe publish information almost on our behalf as an extension of our team to, to address the fact that we don't want to be a bottleneck for publishing, reporting, and making information available. Um, we're even thinking about we might pay for them to be certified as a way of them sort of engaging and committing to, to the process. So um, it just takes a lot of energy, but it's been well worthwhile. And then probably the last thing we did is make information available in a variety of ways. So people can come in and consume information in, in a way that they're comfortable. Um, so it might be from the landing page, which is sorted thematically, to scorecards, to management dashboards. Um, I can click on that and go down to filter-based reports and more tabular detail. Or I can use some pre-governed data sets and use the web edit functionality and go in and build my own reports. And we're now talking about building more direct access. And, and David touched on something where starting to consider is how do people just have direct SQL access and in governed sets to, to start to interrogate information themselves. Um, so that's all very interesting. I think uh, people want to see that this is driving value. And I think we, we've probably got a lot of use cases, but a, a, a few just examples of where we start to see value. And it man manifests itself in a, in a number of ways. Um, the first I just called the, the value of sharing insights interactively. And the example here is uh, every semester we have a, quite a senior quorum of people come together at enrollment times to look at what we used to call our pre-intake tracking reports, which is really just a getting influential people together at a point in time to ensure that the enrollment process is working effectively and any tactical deployment of activity that needs to get students from an application through to enrollment successfully and with a good experience is, is engaged. Um, this previously used to take massive amounts of consolidation of Excel sheets and reports on a Sunday night. It was consumed statically on a Monday meeting for three hours, pouring through spreadsheets. Um, this is now all live in production. So people just access this um, in production on the Monday morning. They can actually, they just dial in. Whoever's chairing the meeting will filter down to areas of, of exception or discussion. A, a decision will be made or it'll be unfiltered. We'll move on to the next roadblock. It's cut down time. It means people don't have to turn up. Actually, one of the more important things is we can also be very secure as to who has access to this. So instead of emails being sent and attachments and things being printed and left on the printer, this is commercially sensitive information. We can now restrict who has access to it. The second is the, the value of data democratization. The HEMS data, for those that, that work with it, the Higher Education Information Management System, has vast amounts of rich information um, on all sorts of performance measures. And you have your own detailed information, and you have all of, the, all of the sector benchmarks for all the other institutions across Australia. This is a gold mine of information, and it was just not being used. Or if it was being used, it was being used a very small sample set of it. Um, no prior reporting was available to the university, and what was tending to happen is the business was sourcing data themselves manually, from publications, from websites, or they were doing it just for a thin slice of the HEMS data set. Um, we've now built out the entire HEMS set with every measure available, and that's obviously in production. And what we're finding is this has been used by vastly greater groups of people, marketing, product development, strategy and innovation, our academic areas, et cetera. Um, the third example is the value of delivery efficiency and just being more nimble. Um, a couple of examples here, the, the quality in learning and teaching survey data. Um, that used to, every time we get it, that would take a week or more to, to build in and update. It takes us about, because we have now some processes for handling disparate data and we've got some structure in place, it takes us about 30 minutes to upload the moment that data's out. And so we can get that out to people on the day it's released. 
Um, Austrade data similarly is in an Excel format that's pretty unmanageable for a lot of people. It changes over time. The lineage isn't necessarily all that clear. We put a lot of work in to actually build that out so that um, that's available and updated to people. And that gives really Im important information around enrolments by country of origin for our international team, et cetera, for compliance and what have you. And so that's all, um, that, that's also interesting. I think some of the real value though starts to, starts to come from all the foundational work driving some of the analytical capability. And I think David touched on some of the things. I think for every university, attrition propensity modeling and starting to intervene has to be one of the key things that, that that a university deploys. Um, we were very for fortunate, we actually hired someone who did her PhD at the university in attrition propensity modeling. Um, so she was a natural fit for the, pro for the activity. Um, her problem was she was having to scrape information together again in fairly disparate fashions from all over the place. Um, what she now has available is, is a productionized integrated data set that allows her to bring all the meaningful attributes together. Uh, and she's built out a rich, suite of attrition propensity models using machine learning and other techniques to identify different models that are most predictive for different cohorts at different stages of the enrollment cycle um, during semester as more information comes to hand. Uh, and this is obviously all in production and available for her. Um, we actually took some of the results of the, of, of the models that had been built and last semester we actually did our first intervention campaign off that data where we identified just over a thousand high-risk students, new, en new student enrollments broke them into a case control group and actually then based on segmentation and the attribute of analysis uh, had people call up and actually engage students to talk to them about their experience, to talk to them about the various services that were available depending on the attributes that, that were being, I guess, profiled in, in the prediction. Uh, and then we would look at the re-enrolment rate in semester two as a proxy for the efficacy of that trial. And we found that was statistically significant. Um, very much so, and so it was a very encouraging outcome for us that, that this is on the right track. And I think we haven't really, re really done the best job yet because there's a whole lot of information that we're now starting to build into this. This year is our first year on Canvas, the learning management platform. So we'll have 3,000 units in Canvas with really rich information around who's consuming what video content, who's engaging with our portal. Um, we're capturing uh, video consumption and also Echo 360 live <coughs> lecture capture data and who's using those. We've got um, things on commute, distance and time, that's already actually uploaded as an attribute. Um, student life, who's engaging in what activities, sporting clubs, events, who's turning up to open day activities, et cetera. And so all of these are actually being built into the current suite of models and we think they're going to be a lot more predictive, but also a lot more informative as to the type of intervention that might be appropriate. We're also considering how we might use the new Adobe marketing platform to take some of this, segment students into risk categories and, and um, the types of cohorts of students to then think about how we might engage with them and intervene. Um, so lower risk students, maybe through targeted sort of EDM approach, higher risk students routed out to particular student engagement staff with, with expertise in certain areas to then engage with them. So we're, we're trying to think about how you might intervene in a more meaningful and targeted fashion. Um, another area we've done a lot of work in is, is load forecasting. Um, load forecasting is pivotal for the university for so many reasons. Um, obviously, um, the, the idea around resource utilization, facilities utilization, curriculum and planning, timetabling, as well as uh, you know, load for, um, financial forecasting is imperative. I've been involved in this since I joined the university, and it's fair to say um, we weren't doing all that great a job. Um, we seem to be out by a fair bit, and this didn't seem to be a really clear process. So we spent a lot of time um, and invested a lot of energy into building uh, what we think is now very accurate, um, particularly for our returning student cohorts, a very accurate view of who's likely to return. Uh, and again, it's a branch of machine learning, supervised machine learning regression. Uh, and you can see we've actually tested suites of models and ensembles of models to ensure that we don't overfit that are within half a percent accurate when we go and test these models historically. And so that gives us a great confidence that we can start to very dynamically look at our returning student cohort as our new student enrolment projections change. Um, we've actually linked new student and returning student enrolments so we get five year views. We've actually linked rates so that we get real time financial forecasts off the back of this. And what this does is allow us to do load forecasting for this year and next year far earlier in the year. So we actually have a view of next year, mid April this year. Um, it, the first view doesn't require a whole lot of human intervention and that intervention is saved for the curation by finance, by marketing, by our academic areas after the 15th of April, but we should already be within, within very close um, parameters to, to what's actually likely to transpire. Um, 
one of the things with forecasting and low planning is we now can actually form a view of unit enrolments next year. And if you think we've got unit enrolments, and David started to touch on this as well, we have uh, access to academic workload data in terms of which academic was teaching which instance, how many instances of a given unit ran each week, which room those instances were in, what is the room capacity of that room. We can start to adapt changes in unit enrolment based on comparable room sizes and academic capability in terms of who can teach what to start to look at the idea of running constraint optimization or cost function algorithms to optimize for the maximum utilization of allocable teaching hours and reduce our sessional cost. Um, and this is important because we, you know, we see across the board a lot of reliance on sessional staff and a lot of that's deliberate and strategic. Some of that I think is maybe done because we're not necessarily being as efficient as possible. But what's great about this is this is now linked to our load forecast. So as that changes and assumptions change, um, if our enrolment in a given unit is likely to exceed last year, then it maybe hits a ceiling of room capacity. We would have to add more instances. We would have to resource it. And so the whole thing around load forecasts and resourcing is interconnected. Um, now that we have load forecasts and resource forecasts, we can start to look at unit delivery margin, so or labour delivery margin at a unit level. And probably the unit is spurious, but I think starting to look at that at things like uh, department or school or even faculty or at field of education starts to become quite interesting. What's doing well, what's not? What can we learn from that? How might we tweak the delivery of certain material or, or, or content um, to become more efficient? And so this is providing, this is very early days. We haven't actually used this with a vengeance yet, but this is going to be a key data point when we look at products and product rationalization and re-accreditation and how we deliver content going forward. And then finally, um, this year I had a student um, a third year student that I took on and he actually brought all this together um, to create what we're calling a bit of an end-to-end -end modeling capability, um, again in AWS. Um, so if you think about the fact that we have a load forecast and that load forecast can then be used for resource optimization which then gives a unit delivery, um, he's actually brought all of this together so that if anyone goes in and adds 10 students to a given course, for example, and drops it into S3, the whole thing triggers and recalculates. So I can recalculate all my resource optimization. I can recalculate all my margins. All the visualizations spit out um, en route so I can see the, the lineage and events that took place and what the change was. Uh, and he's got this down to about seven minutes. So it's not real-time scenario planning, but it's, it's near real-time for us when we didn't have it. Um, and our planning process took sometimes eight months. So uh, this is a, and five of those minutes is actually in the resource optimization calc. So we're trying to think of ways to collapse that. I might, Joe, I might talk to you later. Um, so, and this removes bottlenecks. Um, it allows users to upload stuff and almost see the, what transpires as a result without it having to wait for us or for finance to run it through the GL or, and so it actually empowers users to play around with that. Um, and, and so we think this is going to, we'll probably use this with a vengeance for, for the end of this year budgeting for next year. And we're looking at not only changing, you know, the EFSL forecast for the new student enrollment forecast, but also rates and pricing at the field of education. What if the EBA changes and we have to allocate more time to staff? What if a research allocation of an academic goes from 10% to 20%? Um, what if I can now teach a unit or I can't teach a unit? How does that impact? And so there's, there's a whole lot of things that we can flex to have a pretty dynamic model that brings all this together. Um, Realising the value, we, we tried to put this slide just to sort of show where we think some of the value actually starts to stack up. Um, we actually fortuitously surveyed about 230 users before we deployed Dapper, so three years ago. It wasn't me, someone had the foresight to do this. Um, and talked to them, how much time a month do you spend on data prep and reporting? Uh, and they provided a response, and if you ex extrapolate that response by 12 months, by 800 plus users that we currently have, you end up with about 100,000 hours of time spent on data prep and data reporting, which is only 6% of those data people's job per month, which doesn't feel over the top. If you assume our entire team is servicing nothing but the reporting that is now not being done by those people, at 51,000 hours, you get significant saving that you can annualize in terms of work that is now not happening elsewhere that, that should be being used for more value-add activity. Um, and so you get this efficiency gain, and even if we only save half their time and they're still scrapping around for data that we don't have or, or they just love data and they can't help themselves, um, being pragmatic, there's still significant savings. Take out Tableau costs, take out the $1.50 for AWS costs, you get a massive efficiency benefit. Student retention, we know we've quantified that. It was, it was a significant amount of money in terms of re-enrollment and the, the full value of those students over time. 
timetabling where we've reduced instances or collapsed instances or reallocated workload. And you're talking benefits today that are three million plus, and that's, that's an annual benefit that you get baked into each year. And there's more there, I think, um, particularly on the retention and timetabling side. Um, just a couple of other things we're doing. These are new. We're, tomorrow we're presenting to our academic uh, the use of a consolidated governed data set, which is the first time we brought together all views of a product or a course, um, both internal and external. What we like about this is it's not only bringing in um, our live data at a granular course level with benchmarked industry and sector information, but it's actually bringing in things like employment projections from ABS five years out. So we're starting to bring for the first time live data, PEMS data, historical data, uh, and also projected government data or employment data to start to look at, how embarrassing is that? Um, to start to bring this view all into one place and this will service accreditation, but it'll also service um, faculty planning, um, new product development decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other thing, and David's touched on this eloquently, some of the work they're doing with, with Canvas, you know, we're doing a lot in this space as well. Um, one of the things we've just started playing around with is some, something really simple that should make a big difference, and that is a workload schedule. So how do you, how do you just take a look at the assignment schedule um, based on a typical course unit distribution and start to look at what, what demands we're we placing not only on our students but on our staff who take this course? You know, and what we find is peak load at certain times. Could we start to think about how we might distribute that more evenly to take effort off people? For example, from an academic point of view, I might need sessional resource to come in and help you know, at these peak periods and then I've got periods of lull, how do I start taking cohorts and balancing the load? Um, just to change tack ever so slightly, another way that we're adding value through data and analytics is last year we launched a data consultancy at Swinburne University um, called the Data Experience. We actually employ third year students in their industry placement year for 12 months. Um, we run them through a boot camp for, th for three months, intensive, um, theory every morning, practical activity every afternoon for three months straight around how they engage with business, personal skills, business acumen, um, design, human-centered design, um, report design, very strong focus on technology, AWS and Tableau. Um, we then get them to do an internal project to cut their teeth on stakeholder management and delivery and communication. We have them do their Tableau certification exam externally. We get them ready for their Tableau certification exam externally. So it's the idea of a little bit of micro-credentialization. Um, then we have them uh, go out and do paid industry experience for the remaining period of that 12 months um, where they go out and they might provide resourcing, they might provide um, BI support, reporting support, analytical support uh, with our mentorship on, on site with clients. The idea is at the end of it we actually want to lose our students. We want them poached and we want to start again. And what companies are getting is they're getting you know, highly technically competent with, um, students with business acumen, with our support and, and mentorship thrown in. Uh, and what we're hoping that, uh, is that this drives organic enrolment into our placement program because students see the value of um, a direct route through to employment, but also that they get to pick up a lot of these industry um, recognised certifications along the way. And then finally, um, on Friday of this week, we actually launch um, the Swinburne Data for Social Good Cloud Innovation Centre, hence the shameless plug with the, the hoodie. Um, this is the eighth cloud innovation centre globally and the first in the southern hemisphere. Um, and as you can see, it's starting to form a, a bit of a connected network of innovation centres globally. Uh, and we're launching that this Friday in Melbourne. We announced it in May, but we're launching it formally um, on the campus in Friday. And the intent of these cloud innovation centres is for us to work with public sector, not-for-profit and educational organisations to help drive digital transformation and digital innovation for clients. Um, they're 10 to 8 to 10 week engagements where our students and industry partners um, as well as Swinburne researchers tackle challenges that are meaningful to, to a client organisation. Um, they use obviously the benefits of all the cloud technologies and capabilities that are available and we're focusing primarily in the space of health, social innovation, social inclusiveness and smart cities research, and obviously underpinned by data science. And these alignments actually align perfectly to the Swinburne Research Institute structure where we have um, a, a depth of expertise. And um, we've actually, we're eight weeks into our first challenge. We're trying to get a challenge done before we launch with a, with a hospital, and the students are actually prototyping a, a type two diabetes virtual dietitian that patients will use to really um, try and adhere to a more healthy lifestyle to prevent them readmitting back into to hospitals. So, 
they're the types of things that we're going to be doing through this challenge and, and we look forward to working with the public sector. Thank you.